general characteristics of senses. Basically, we have general senses and special senses. Like it helps us maintain homeostasis. We've talked about some of these senses. So we talk about the general senses that we basically just went through, getting that information in and processing it. And then we have these spe special senses that what we consider to be our senses in terms of hearing and vision and taste and that sort of thing. So um, that's what we're going to look at. With these sensory receptors, they respond to a specific stimuli. They are particularly sensitive, very, very sensitive to a certain type of environmental change um, and less sensitive to others, and we'll talk about some of these. Um, but we have these five types of sensory receptors. Chemoreceptors, pain receptors, te temperature receptors, called thermoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, and photoreceptors. So chemoreceptors are going to, <clears throat> as it said, is respond to a change in chemicals. A smell, a taste oxygen concentration, CO2 concentration, some kind of chemical. Then you have nociceptors, which are pain receptors. These are uh, help us respond to tissue damage in terms of well, we got had some cut to them. We've had some electrical burn. We've had a regular burn from heat, something like that. Thermoreceptors allow us to uh, adapt to changes in the actual physical environmental temperature and internal temperature. Mechanoreceptors, uh, we'll talk about this, but it's mechanical forces that distort these. We're talking about blood pressure, stretch receptors, what's, you know, um, and we'll go into that a little bit later on. And then photoreceptors responding to light. So the first thing is you can get what's called sensory adaptation. And this is the ability to ignore a continuous stimuli. Um, you probably are sitting in a room right now, and you may have the heater going or the air conditioner, depending on the season, and you don't even pay attention to it because your brain has said, okay, I've heard it. I hear the air conditioner, I hear the heater, I don't need to respond to it anymore. It's not something i got to worry about. So you do adaptation to it, and you just ignore it. All right, so this is, you get a decreased response to a particular stimuli that is just constantly pinging, if you will. So when that adaptation occurs, the impulses become less fre uh, frequent, and they may cease, and you've got to have a stronger stimuli to hear to hear it again. So any background noise that you're used to hearing, and then something changes, and then you will notice that. Um, uh, another one is, it, oh, this works very well with olfactory receptors. You sit there, you go into a room, you notice somebody's perfume because they came in, and after a few minutes, and like, I don't smell anything. That's exactly what it is. All right, so you have three types of mechanical receptors that respond to touch and pressure. A couple of these we've already talked about before. But you have free nerve endings. You have tactile corpuscles or Meissner corpuscles, and then the laminated corpuscles, the Pacinian corpuscles. All right, so we've already talked about the, the bottom two. But our free nerve endings are very common in that epithelial tissue. These are the simplest ones. This is itching and other sensations on the skin. The tactile corpuscles, fine touch, texture, distinguish between two points. So if you have like a, a mathematical compass and you're, pu you're putting both points into your hand, it allows you to, to distinguish that you are being touched by two points rather than one. The Pacinian corpuscles, this is common, again, in the deep cutaneous tissue, and this allows us to detect heavy pressure and vibrations. All right. Our thermoreceptors, we have free nerve endings, we have warm receptors, we have cold receptors, and they just have temperature resistant, the temperature ranges. So warm receptors, sen sen sensitive to temperatures above 25 degrees Celsius, this is basically room temperature, 
and anything above 113 they don't respond cold receptors sensitive to temperatures between you know 50 and 68 you know and tell you you're cold um, your pain receptors respond to temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit 10 degrees Celsius and it produces a freezing sensation and it temperatures above the 45 with it produces a burning sensation so we've got kind of like this set point between uh, 50 and 113 where um, we're going above or below that we're going to really notice it pain receptors these are widely distributed uh, nervous tissue uh, does not have pain receptors um, and these are going to again uh, stimulated by tissue damage that sort of thing they don't adapt so this is why you can have continuous pain okay all right visceral visceral pain these the receptors in the viscera um, and they respond differently to the stimuli that are on the surface um, you may have what's called referred pain which is an exam you know where it seems to be coming from someplace else the example they give you you know heart pain that you feel pain coming down the left shoulder the left arm gallbladder problems the shoulder again um, on that that right shoulder um, so it's just referred pain and it results from these common pathways that you have um, and um, they just happen to sit and dance together. So you can see that liver and gallbladder area, the heart area, and that's just referred pain. All right, so let's take a look at these special senses, the smell, the taste, the hearing, the sight. Um, and we have special organs for these. Um, and we're going to start with smell. I'm not going to go into real deep um, on this. You can uh, take a look at it, and then your professor obviously is going to cover this. So, sense of smell, olfaction, uh, the receptors are chemoreceptors, and they respond to chemicals that are dissolved in a liquid. And um, the sense of smell is a lot of our sense of taste. So, about 80% of tasting is our sense of smell. This is why when we get out of this, the people know it's like this, we can't taste anything. Okay. All right, so the olfactory organs, you have olfactory receptor cells, um, and they cover the upper part of the nasal cavity and the conchi in the nose. You'll take a look at this in AP2, uh, part of the septum, and basically the whatever you're smelling binds to the well, several hundreds of different membrane receptors, and of course you get depolarization, results in action potential and that information is sent in terms of the sense of taste sense of taste gustation um, you have taste buds most of us are pretty familiar with these taste buds but you've got about 10,000 taste buds they are chemoreceptors um, you have microvilli that protrude through the through the um, pores and this is a very sensitive part of the taste cell taste cells and the cells are replaced about every three days believe it or not so you can see these little lovely little taste buds most of us know the f the five primary uh, taste sensations and you can see they're stimulated by different things sweets by carbohydrates sours by acids etc so sweet sour salty bitter and umami okay um, each flavor results in one primary taste sensation or combination spicy foods can stimulate a class of pain receptors as most of us know the taste receptor the receptors do undergo a rapid adaptation so just FYI that's why that first taste tastes better than as you go through the meal all right looking at the ear um, we have three sections of the ear the outer ear the middle ear the inner ear the actual outside of the ear is the oracle or the pinna um, and this is going to collect the sound waves 
and then it goes into what we call the external acoustic meatus or external auditory meatus. And this is a kind of S-shaped tube, and it is lined with ceruminous glands, and we learned that that secretes wax, our lovely earwax. And then that carries the sound to the, to the tympanic membrane, to the eardrum, and it ends there. When we get to the tympanic membrane, that vibrates um, because of the sound waves hitting it. All right, then we go into the middle ear, and... Basically, we're entering the tympanic cavity, which is an air-filled space, and in there we have the auditory ossicles, or literally ear bones, and they vibrate as they're touching against, the malleus is touching against that tympanic membrane, and they start to vibrate. And so this basically that vibration, it amplifies them, um, and we have the Malleus, the ingus, and the stapes. I know you guys have been taught hammer, anvil, stirrup. We're in anatomy and physiology, so it's the malleus, the ingus, and the stapes. Um, and there is an opening in the wall of that tympanic cavity, and the stapes vibrates against what we call the oval window to, uh, to move the fluids in the inner ear. And you can see there's our tympanic membrane, there's the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and you can see that oval window right there. Okay, so also in that middle ear is the eustachian tube or the auditory tube, auditory canal sometimes, and it's going to connect the middle ear to the throat. And most of us know this is how we can maintain air pressure we just hold our nose together and blow and um, that helps us equalize air pressure um, and it is, we have valve like flaps in the throat that are, is usually closed um, but um, yeah it's a good connection and one of the problems we run into is a middle ear infection otitis media um, this is because the mucous membranes of that tube are down in there are continuous and bacteria can can, tra can travel from the pharynx the back of the throat the or the oral pharynx back up to the nasal pharynx back into the middle ear um, this is mainly due to it found in younger children because the the station tubes the auditory tubes are short and they are more horizontal and as you grow into an adult and you're your head gets larger, that tube begins to tilt more down so it can drain better. But it's not unusual for you to children because of that short, flat tube for that to be fluid in there, and that is a perfect growing area for bacteria. Um, you may have some a tube put in there, uh, a tympanostomy tube, which allows the drainage of that uh, fluid um, but treated with antibiotics. The inner ear is a labyrinth, a maze, if you will, kind of sort of thing. You have a bony labyrinth, which is a canal. It is filled with a fluid called perilymph. And you have a membranous labyrinth, which is a tube of, that lays within that, that bony labyrinth and is filled with endolymph. There are three portions of this, the cochlea, the semicircular canals, and the vestibule. The cochlea, uh, hearing, the semicircular canals, we'll talk about this dynamic equilibrium, and the vestibule, what we call static equilibrium. So you can take a look at this. These are semicircular canals. There's the cochlea there. And you, this is a cutaway of that cochlea, and we'll talk about that. So when you look into the inner ear, you do have quote-unquote windows, two membrane-covered windows. You have an oval window and the round window. The oval window, we already talked about that. That's the opening in that wall, the tympanic cavity, and the stapes transfers those vibrations to the fluid of the inner ear. So vibrations will start to stimulate these hearing receptors. The round window is a window in the wall of the inner ear that facing that tympanic cavity, and it dissipates excess vibrations that may be coming in there. So the cochlea, it looks like a snail. It's a spiral tube. 
um, can't, becomes very narrow at the tip. Um, there are three compartments, the scala vestibuli, the scala tympani, and the cochlear duct. Um, we'll look at these, um, but basically you have, uh, kind of look at here and you can see this like this. So you have a, basically a cochlear duct, and this is what we call the organ of corti that we'll talk about. This touches the scala tympani, and then the, you have the scala vestibuli. Okay, so the three membranes, you have the vestibular membrane, the basilar membrane, and the tutorial membrane. And you have basically, again, these three areas. And so the vestibular membrane separates the scala vestibuli from the cochlear duct. The uh, basilar membrane separates the cochlear duct from the scala temp tympani. And then you have basically this tectorial membrane uh, that forms the roof of that spiral, the, the organ of corti, or what we call the spiral organ. So you can see these membranes here, the vestibular membrane, the basilar membrane, and you can see this tectorial membrane coming over and touching there. So you can see that in there, this is the organ of corti, and these are the little hair cells that we'll talk about. So, the organ of corti is the organ with in the where we get that sense of hearing. It sits, as we mentioned, on the surface of that basilar membrane. It contains receptors called hair cells, and these hair cells have cilia or villi. The tectorial membrane passes over like a roof, okay, and the sound vibrations cause that cilia to con contact and bend against that membrane. And the different frequencies move different parts of that membrane. And basically, these the, you have that information is transferred then to the cochlear nerve. And you have receptor cells in different regions of the cochlear duct that detect different frequencies of vibration, okay? All right, hearing loss is a problem with some people. You can have different types of hearing loss. You can have conductive deafness, um, which is most of the cases where it's caused by a lot of people come into doctors and they can't hear well, they got too much earwax in them. Or you've got an injury to the membrane or an injury to those auditory ossicles, or you've got a sclerosis in there. Um, then you have sensory neural deafness, which is damage to the cochlea itself, damage to the to the nerve, um, damage to the nerve pathways. This can be caused. Uh, a lot of a lot of the baby boomers um, have this hearing loss because they listen to really loud music for long periods of time. But explo explosions, being you know a factory noise, the being exposed to loud, loud, loud sounds over a long time, or a very loud, short kind of explosion. All right, it can also be caused by brain damage from a stroke or, or drugs or that sort of thing. All right, sense of equilibrium, we mentioned uh, two senses. We have static equilibrium and we have dynamic equilibrium. And this, in basically static senses the position of the head when the body is not moving. So you're sitting and you're moving your head. Uh, these are found in the vestibule, um, and we'll talk about that, this is the saccule and the utricle. Um, the dynamic equilibrium senses rotation and movement of the head of the body, and these receptors are found in the semicircular canals. So the static, as I mentioned, is the utricle and the saccule. Um, these are chambers of the, 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 the Lamberth. Um, and basically you have a patch of hair cells and they're embedded with this gelatinous material um, with what we call autolysis, this calcium carbonate crystals and the gravity pulls on the, this gelatinous mess um, when the head changes position and these autolysis shift position and pull on this and pull on the cilia, the hair cells and when, when those cells bend, when those hairs bend, you get a generation of the ne nerve impulse. So here's your utricle and your saccule right here. Okay, 
and that is your static wheel wheelie. You're sitting and you're bending and theirs are moving. Your dynamic equilibrium is in the semicircular canals. The, you have three canals. They are at right angles to each other. Um, there is a swelling at the at one end of them um, that is called an ampulla, and this communicates with the vestibule itself. Um, the organ for the dynamic equilibrium, the crista ampullaris, and this again cause, contains hair cells and supporting cells, and these are in the ampulla. Um, but basically, what happens is, is this is this is the liquid where this liquid is in these, and wherever you tilt your head, move your head back and forth, or whatever, you've got these semicircular canals at three different angles, and it's going to tell you how your head is moving. All right, so on to your vision. Uh, the visual receptors are found in the eye. You have accessory organs, which are the upper and lower eyelids, your eyelashes, your lacrimal what we call the lacrimal apparatus for making tears and then you have your eye muscles for eye movement you do have six eye muscles and you can see this they're called rectus muscles superior inferior medial lateral that just makes sense okay superior up and medial inferior down and medial medial medially lateral lateral all right and then you have the obliques um superior and inferior, so rotates the eye down, eye down and laterally, and eye up and laterally. So you can take a look at these. Now the eye itself, a hollow spherical organ has three layers. Um, I showed you this on the model, um, but you have an outer layer, a middle layer, and an inner layer. And you can see that. Okay, the outer layer can, is consists of the cornea and the sclera. Um, the sclera is basically the whites of your eyes. Um, this protects the eyes and this is where the muscles actually attach. Um, you do have blood vessels in there and we all know we have blood vessels because we can see blood vessels when we get red eyes and we can see that you know we had some stress we can see those blood vessels. Then you have the cornea. This is a the transparent window of the eye. It helps to focus the light rays. It transmits those light rays and refracts the light. The middle layer is the choroid and the ciliary bodies and the iris. The choroid is just inside that sclera. It provides the blood supply. It also provides uh, melanocytes coloring and it absorbs this uh, melanin that absorbs any extra stray light. Um, the ciliary body, um, this changes the lens so it can be focused. You have ciliary muscles uh, that actually move the lens so that you can you can focus. And then the iris obviously um, contracts or dilates to control the amount of light entering in the eye through the pupil. So you have cavities in the eyes. You have an anterior cavity and a posterior cavity. So the anterior cavity of the eye is the cavity between the cornea and the lens. And this is filled with a watery fluid aqueous humor. Um, the lens is transparent. It is biconcave. It lays behind that iris um, it is held in place by ligaments, and it helps focus the light. And basically, the lens is able to change shape, uh, so you can view close objects and, um, you know, change so that you can focus on things. So you can see this cornea. You can see this anterior chamber. Um, you have a posterior chamber. So basically, what you have is what's called an anterior cavity and you have an anterior chamber and then that is separated by that iris and behind there is the posterior chamber um, but you have aqueous humor in all this entire chamber okay all right now as we said the iris controls the amount of light um, it is connective tissue and smooth muscle 
and that is the colored portion of our eye. And the pupil, again, is the window in there. Dim light dilates the eye. Bright light constricts that eye, I should say pupil. Um, and the, the genetics in terms of where this melanin is, is di distributed determines your eye color. You've got several genes that determine eye color. The aqueous humor is literally, it is watery. That's why it's called aqueous humor. It fills both the anterior and posterior chambers. And it circulates through the pupil. And basically it provides nutrients and it maintains the shape of that anterior portion of the eye. All right. Then you have the posterior cavity. And that contains, instead of a watery liquid, it contains what we call vitreous humor. It's a gel-like substance. Think of a uh, jello that is, is, is not really, as it's just about set. That's the consistency of that gel. And what it's going to do is hold that retina flat up against that choroid coat and maintain the shape of that eye. Okay. Um, when we look at the retina, the retina um, has visual receptors called photoreceptors. It is continuous with the optic nerve that's in the back. Um, and you have an area towards the back which is called the macula. Um, it's a yellowish spot. I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and the center of that is called the fovea centralis, and that is the center of that macula lutea, and that provides our um, sharpest vision because it's cones. Uh, the optic disc in the back, and I'll show you that too, is the blind spot. There are no photoreceptors there. Um, this is where the nerve fibers from the retina actually leave out and become the octa optic nerve, so there are no photoreceptors there. So if we take a look at this through an ophthalmoscope, you can see that lovely little macula, and you can see that phobius and that uh, optic disc, sorry, optic disc here, and that fovea centra centralis here, this macula, this raised area here. Okay. All right. So that's our layers of the eye. Um, most of us, a lot of us, um, as we get older, <laughs> have to have glasses. And we basically call them refraction disorders. You can have farsightedness, nearsightedness. Um, usually most people that are... Um, there's farsightedness of what we call age, and basically this begins at about 45 to 50, and we use the we lose the elasticity of the lens, and we have to have reading glasses. Um, and then you have nearsightedness, and th the same thing. Um, basically, you're having to correct for this. The light is focused in the front of the retina. And so you get these blurry images for these distant distance objects. And then farsightedness, again, the eyeball is too short. The, the light is focusing in the back of the retina, and it causes blurry, blurry visions for close objects. So you can see the um, correction. And astigmatism is where you have the curvature of the lens or the cornea has issues, and so the, you get a visual distortion some parts are in focus and some parts are not. All right, in terms of being able to see, we have the photoreceptors are called rods and cones. Um, the rods provide vision in dim light, and they provide vision without color in shades of gray. Your color is determined by your cones. You have pigments in the cones, um, you can see this erythrolab that's red, a chlorolab green, and cyanolab blue. And we get color vision only in bright light. Most of us realize we go into a dark room, we are not going to be able to see color. Uh, the cones produce a, a very sharp image, our color vision. And as I mentioned before, the fovea, fovea centralis, which is the center of the macula, only has cones. So that's what and you can take a look at these lovely pictures of the rods and cones. 
These are the different pigments, again, that you have. The very light sensitive pigments that decompose when they're absorbing light. Um, and they basically trigger an impulse. Um, we do have what's called stereoscopic vision. And this results from two slightly different images on the retina and they overlap from the two eyes and combine in our cortex, visual cortex, to form a single three-dimensional object. And this is a good example of showing this. So you're getting information from the left eye and information from the right eye and you get a full three-dimensional object. Okay, congratulations, we are done. Uh, that mean, doesn't mean it's over yet. You make sure you don't drop off and go crazy. You've got to get this material down, buckle down, get through your final exam so that you can get through the course. And just remember everything that you've learned here is going to be important when you go into the next course in AP2. A lot of what you've learned here is going to be used in AP2. So spend that time over that final exam so you kind of Again, put into long-term memory some of this material so that it's going to be there for you when you start into AP2. Good luck.